Hello and welcome to Miss Estrick Biology. This video is going to be a walkthrough of statistic exam questions to help you prepare for any exams you might have coming up. If you are new here, then click subscribe so you don't miss out on any of the latest videos. Now I know lots of you are in a big rush at the moment doing last minute revision for exams. So I've put time codes at the bottom so you can go to particular questions so you can pick and choose which ones to look at to help you. But I will be doing questions that look at standard deviation chi-squared, correlation coefficient, and the t-test. So first of all, just a recap on how to know which statistic to use. And it depends on, firstly, which type of data you collect. So data can either be categorized as continuous, so that would be something like height, because you don't fit into a certain category for your height. It can be any value on a scale. Or the alternative is frequencies, and this is when you do count how many individuals fit into a category. So we'll have a look at the continuous data options first of all. And it could either be investigating an association between two measurements, or in other words, a correlation, or it could be investigating a difference between two means. So if you're looking at an association, then you'd be using a correlation coefficient statistic. If you're looking at a difference between two means, it'd be student t-test. And then if it's frequencies, investigating a difference between the numbers of individuals in two categories or more, that would be chi-squared. Now, the reason I include this is one of the types of questions you could get is identifying which statistics you have to use and justify your choice. So the information in the blue and the yellow boxes would be your justification for each of these. So let's get to the exam questions. First of all, we've got a standard deviation question. So a geneticist investigated genetic diversity in four different species of grass. She compared the DNA-based sequences of the same genes from a large number of grass samples from each species. She then calculated the mean genetic diversity for each species the value of this mean was somewhere between zero and one. And um, one as a mean value shows the maximum genetic diversity, zero shows no genetic diversity, and her results are here in the table. So the question, and this is three marks, what do these data show about the differences in genetic diversity between the grasses? So looking at the table, we can see we've got the mean genetic diversity. So one thing it's going to tell us is um, how diverse is it? So if it's closer to one, it's more diverse. Closer to zero, there's less genetic diversity. But we've also been given the standard deviation. And what that will tell us is whether there's a significant difference between the genetic diversities of the four species. And the way you'd work that out is the plus or minus symbol here indicates that you would add on 0.03 to the mean and you would subtract also 0.03 from the mean. And that gives you this range of um, standard deviations or the variance around the mean. And you would then compare that to all of the others and see when you take into account the standard deviations, do any of those means actually overlap? Now, in this case, none of them do. Even if you added on your standard deviation or took it away, none of those would overlap. So for that reason, here would be our answers. Species three has the greatest genetic diversity. It's closest to one. Species two is closest to zero. So that is the least genetically diverse. And then we do have to talk about the standard deviation. If ever you're given standard deviation, you're guaranteed there's marks linked to it. So the standard deviations do not overlap. Um, and then you also have to say what that means. So that would mean that they are all significantly different means. Question two is the correlation coefficient. So describe briefly how you'd use a statistical test to find whether there is a significant correlation between the mean atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration and the Earth's surface temperature. So for this one, you would start by writing a null hypothesis. That's how you always start your statistics. Then you have to say which statistic you would use. Now it's a correlation, so that would be our correlation coefficient, or you could say specifically Spearman's rank, and then you would actually calculate the st test statistic. 
Once you've got your answer, you then have to look it up in the critical values table for the p-value of 0.05. Now, if you're not sure what I mean by that sentence, I'll link my video up here on Spearman's rank and critical values tables and how you'd use it for more clarity on that. You would then look at what figure it is in your table to work out whether you accept or reject the null hypothesis. So some statistics questions don't actually involve any calculations. It is actually just talking through the process of how you would go about calculating your statistic and analyzing what the result tells you. So the second part of this question, scientists found that there was a correlation between the mean atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration and the Earth's surface temperature. Can you conclude that atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration caused the temperature to increase? And then you have to explain your answer. Now for this, the answer is no, you cannot conclude, but there's not a mark for saying no. Both marks are for the explanation. And whenever there's a correlation, this is quite a common question. Um, you could be asked, does that prove causation? And with correlations, a standard phrase to remember is correlation does not prove causation. So what we mean by that is just because there was an association that as there was more carbon dioxide, the temperature increased, that doesn't prove that carbon dioxide was the only cause or the sole cause of that temperature increase. So that is why the first mark would always be correlation does not prove causation, or well, they phrase it slightly differently here. The second mark is for pointing out it could still be due to another factor, or in some cases you can name the factor. So for this example, you could say, for example, it could be other greenhouse gases such as methane. So question three, we're now looking at a t-test or sometimes called student's t-test. The scientists used a statistical test to determine whether there was a significant difference in the glucose concentrations in two soft drinks, and they obtained a value for P of 0.04. Now I'm going to link my student T test video up here, so if you aren't quite sure on this statistic and what we mean by P values, then have a look at that one first. So in this question they were asked to name the statistical test the scientists used and give a reason for your answer um, and then you have to use that value of p to say was the difference significant so this links to the flow diagram that i showed you at the start so first of all the choice would be students t-test now yes that's quite obvious because that was the title of this slide but the reason is you're looking at a difference or looking for a difference between two means now, your explanation of this p-value um, is it is a significant difference. And that's the first bit. Was the difference significant? Yes, it was. And your explanation is the p-value of 0.04 is less than the p-value of 0.05. And you have to have a value less than or equal to 0.05 to be able to conclude that it is a significant difference. And that's because it means that you have less than 5% probability that the difference is due to chance. So question four on p-values. Now this has come up in some of the earlier questions, but this one's quite a good one to really focus on do you understand what a p-value is? So the ecologists recorded the number of each species of butterfly caught in traps, and the table below summarizes their results. So we've got a range of butterfly species. Um, they've recorded the mean number in two locations, in the canopy and the understory. And then we've got a p-value. The ecologists carried out a statistical test to see if the differences between the number in the canopy and the understory, or they've said here, the distribution, um, was due to chance. The p-values obtained are shown in the table. So explain what the results of the statistical tests show. So first of all, just a reminder, the p-value is showing you the probability that the difference between these two means is due to chance. So if you've got a p-value of less than 0.001, that means you have a probability of less than 
0.1% that the difference between those two means is due to chance. And because that is less than 0.05 or 5%, that would mean it is significant. So that's what this question is asking you to do for three marks. You need to go through all of these p-values and say which of those are significant um, differences or indicate significant difference and which do not. And the third mark will be for explaining what a p-value is. So let's have a look. So we've been told that for the Xeratus itius, the difference in distribution is probably due to chance, um, or you could say probability of being due to chance is more than 5%. So that is not a significant difference, but they phrased it as um, due to chance. That's why it says that in the mark scheme. For all of the other species, the difference in distribution is unlikely to be due to chance, um, or in other words, it is significant. The reason being the p-value is less than 0.001, which is highly significant, or much lower than 5%. So although the p-value of 0.05 is our threshold to say whether something is significant or not, you do get given p-values lower than that, which would indicate it's highly significant. So that is worth indicating in your answers. Question five, standard deviation. Scientists investigated the placebo effect in patients with asthma. They divided a large number of asthma patients into three groups, and they call those one, two, and three. Group one inhaled a spray containing an active asthma drug every day. Group two had a placebo, but they took it in the same way. It was still a spray and it was still every day. Group three did not receive any spray treatment. The scientists measured the forced expiratory volume, FEV1, of each patient at regular intervals. Now we are being asked, what do the standard deviation bars suggest about the difference in the mean increase in FEV1 between group one and the other groups? Explain your answer. Now here is group one, and we can see straight away, it's obviously got the highest mean, because that's what the bar indicates, and the bar is far higher. And if we were just looking at the means, then group two has a higher mean than group three. However, group two and group three, the standard deviation bars overlap. So we know there's no significant difference between groups two and three. But looking at group one, the standard deviation bar, it's nowhere near the other two. So there's definitely not an overlap. So what that tells us about group one compared to the other groups is, the mean is significantly higher than both of them. And we know that because there is no overlap in the standard deviation. So if we have a look at the marks that were given for this question. So the differences are significant, or you could say they're not due to chance. The reason being the standard deviation bars do not overlap. So that is it for the statistics questions walkthrough. I hope you found it helpful and best of luck with your exams that you've got coming up. If you have found this helpful, please give it a thumbs up.